Well, this morning we start a new series. We preach in series here. If you like that word preach, if you like message better, I like that one better myself too. But as a church, we take a look at a, a topic or a book in God's word, and we try to study for several weeks on a theme and try to really wrestle with it. And not just uh, come every Sunday, there's something brand new, different, with no continuity. But today is the start of a new series, and we're going to do a series called It's Good to Be Mom. And there is a reason that that is the most popular tattoo of all time. Moms simply have a place in our hearts that no one else fits. Now, there's a place in our heart that no one can fit but Jesus, and only he can fill the holes that are inside, but moms have such a unique relationships with us. Now, I say that in advance because some of you today are here, and Mother's Day is one of the toughest days in the year for you. For some, it's a great day of celebration, and sometimes your kids come with you to church, or you might even celebrate your mother-in-law on a day like this. But for others, mom may not have been in the picture. Or mom may have not been what we wanted at all. For some of you, you'd like to be moms, and God hasn't blessed you with that yet. So today is a day that's filled for many with pain, and for many with celebration. And the good news is, I think that the message God's got for us today speaks to all of us. There's two things that we're going to kind of wrestle with in this series. The 2B has a meaning. And now, a Mother's Day moment. You know, Mother's Day is that special day every year where we celebrate the women who brought us uh, into the world. Honey, it actually I, took 12 hours with you. Well, that's right, that's right. My mom was in labor for 12 hours. Thank you, Mom, for reminding me. This is the day that we appreciate all of the hard work and child-rearing years that our mothers... Honey, sit up and enunciate your sentences. And apparently, I need to sit up and enunciate my sentences. Thank you, Mother. A famous person once said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my mother. Now, for me... Now, who said that? I don't know who said it, Mom. Oh, I think it was hmm? JFK. I don't know. Maybe it was JFK. I don't know. I, I know I need to do this, though, right now. So. Don't you sass me. I'm not sassing you. Since moms are there from the beginning, it's really no coincidence that mama is typically a child's first word. I'm not sure that shirt's word. working. I like this shirt. Not dressy enough. It's plenty dressy. Well, put on what I bought you. I don't want to wear that. Well, I gave it to you. I know you gave it to me. I don't want to wear it. You know, a mother's love is something that every child wants. I know I did, and I still do. I... Oh. It's Douglas. Well, answer it, pumpkin. I'm filming. Hello? Uh huh. Tell him hello. Oh, mom says hi. Great. Don't care. Bye. Well, it seems that my mom's favorite son is going to be joining us for lunch. Now, honey, what? don't be rude. That's not rude. That's nice. If you can't say anything what? nice, don't say anything at all. Hmm. Then I guess I won't say anything at all. Great. Douglas is here. Douglas? Daryl. Hey, is this for mom? Hey, can't you just go in the other room for five minutes? <sighs> Mother's Day means Honey, a lot of... we do not live in a barn. What are you talking about? Who said anything about living in a barn? Oh. <sighs> but <laughs> my favorite memory growing up would have to be when, when you I... you went to Ben, 10th grade? Hold on. Oh, this is over, Boys, pal. Stop No, it this right is my now. gift Boys, to mom, listen, man. stop. It, well, you can settle down, pal. So I hope that all you mothers out there have a happy Mother's Day. <laughs> love you, Mom. I love you, too. Since 1914, when President Woodrow Wilson decided that the second Sunday in May should be Mother's Day, we have been celebrating this thing. <laughs> what we're going to take a look at in the rest of the series is two words. Believe and belong. That's the role of a mother. A mother helps to teach us what we believe and how we belong, not only in our own family, but how we belong, more importantly, in the family of God. 
And so throughout this series, we are going to take a look at moms who did a good job at that and moms who didn't do a good job at that at all. Because we learn from both things. We learn from, from greatness and we learn from tragedy. And so as we take a look at different relationships, we're going to do that. A mom's job never ends. Your influence doesn't stop the day that they walk out the door for the first time at age 18 or whenever. Your influence as mom continues on long past that. Your life is preaching. And Francis of Assisi once said, preach without ceasing. If you must, use words. And I think that's the important role of a mother. Because when we teach our kids about believing and belonging, those two lead to something called behaving. And so out of those two things, we're going to take a look at this in this whole series. What I want to encourage you to do this morning is we're going to take a look at what's probably a familiar story for most. It happens on a lot of Mother's Day. We choose to go to this story in the Bible. And I'd like you to turn to the ninth book in the Bible, starting from the Old Testament to 1 Samuel. And I'll have the words up on the screen, but I encourage you to grab a Bible from around you if you didn't bring one. And we're going to take a look at the story in 1 Samuel. And it starts out describing a guy. It says, there was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham. I love the Old Testament names. Most of the time, if you can just keep going nonstop, nobody in the room ever contradicts the way you pronounce it. Only if you realize you've messed it up. Whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. And right from the beginning, we just begin to see that there's a problem. This is a really old story from probably about 3,000 years ago. And number one, we realize that this is not only well before the time of Jesus, this is well before the time that men learned a very important lesson in life. One wife is more than enough. And he's got two. And not only that, but there is a problem in this marriage that's evident for Penina and Hannah. Status symbol for women was in your ability to have children. That was your primary role as wife, was to produce offspring to continue on the family name. And one wife has children, the other doesn't. If there's anything worse than being a wife who can't have kids, it's being the other wife when the first one can. As so we begin to see just how bad the situation is for Hannah. And it describes that year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But catch this. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Now, I'm going to pause in the middle of that slide. Let's take a look at that. Number one, there's this battle going on between these two ladies. But it's clear in this that even though society would say, Hannah, you're not worth anything because you can't produce children, her husband does not feel that way. And instead, he gives a double portion of the sacrifice to her. Clearly, the man loves her, and his, his evaluation of her status is not based on whether she's raised children for him or not. It's clear from the story that Elkanah loves his wife, Hannah. He loves Penina and the children that she's raised. But there's something special about Hannah. Have you ever had anybody just get under your skin? Anybody just know, just how to just, just twist and twist and twist? Penina knows how to do that. And every time they go to worship together, she brings it up again and again and again and again. And they believe that this is somehow God's doing 
that she's not had children. And it says that this went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. There's a problem. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Now, there's something you've got to understand here. Guys are built differently than women. Back in the beginning, I think that when God took out the rib, I think he took out more than just the rib to form the woman. Part of the brain cells clearly went to the women that didn't get to stick around in the men. The sensitivity side of it is rare in a guy, and it shows up here. Guys think typically more on the logical side of this and try to, to rationalize things out. And Elkanah says to her, Oh, sweetheart, don't you understand? I should be worth more than ten sons to you. To any woman who would turn around and almost be ready to slap their husband. Why? Why do you think this? Don't you understand what everybody else says to me? Don't you understand the anguish that I'm in time after time after time because of your other wife? And it goes on time and time again. And there is a problem. There's also a solution. And that's what I want you to focus on this morning. There's three things that we're going to learn about in this relationship between Hannah and Penina and Elkanah and God. And the first thing we're going to take a look at is that we need to make prayer a priority. When you're facing tough stuff in life, a lot of times it's a thing that we run away from God. And those times where we want to say, it's God's fault that I'm in this. We miss such a blessing when we don't, number one, make prayer a priority. And that's what we see in Hannah and Penina and Elkanah and their situation. Watch how she prays. The story continues in verse 9. It says, Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. And in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. Hannah knew the way to fix this, the way to get some kind of relief, is not to continue wallowing in my sorrow. But how do I go to God? And it says, in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And it goes on, it says that she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. She takes a bold step and says, God, I trust you. And if you would just give me this blessing, then I will turn right back around and dedicate him for his whole life to you. If you would give me this blessing, I will in turn turn him back to you. Now that's a bold move. That's a bold move to come before God and say, I would do this. And many of us have good intentions and our follow-through doesn't come anywhere close to our good intentions. And we'll see what happens in Hannah's life. But she makes a vow to God and says as she's praying, Lord, if you would bless me, if you would let me experience this joy, then I won't hold on to him forever. I turn him back to you. <clears throat> and there's a problem. There's a situation that tells us a little bit about their culture. It says, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, but her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Maybe you've had a moment like that. Maybe you've had a time where it was so intense, the sound wouldn't come out. I know somebody who went through that when they found out they were going to have a baby. For the next three days, no sound came out of their mouth. It was such a surprise. She's there. She's praying. She's doing the right thing. And look how Eli the priest responds. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Now, it tells us a little bit. It tells us this is probably a common occurrence. That people would come and they would be drunk. Coming to pray. 
It tells us he has an expectation that this is what it is, and the expectation that people would come and be so intense in their prayer that they couldn't even get the words out wasn't a common thing, that this is the first thing that jumps to his mind. Maybe you've had that. Maybe you've had good intentions in something, and somebody read your situation altogether wrong. You wanted to do the right thing. You were there in your heart, and somebody took a look at what you were doing and tried to squash it. Don't give up. Don't give up. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Have you been noticing all the things in yellow on the screen about how she prayed? And that her way of dealing with this pain and this anguish was not to try to fix it on my own anymore. But how do I come to God and let him work through my life? And Eli answered. He said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. She found solace in the words that he had said that, may God bless your request. And I say that to you this morning. What is it you're praying for? What is it you're hoping for in life? And may God bless that request when it's to honor him. But there was a problem. If you go back to verse 5, and it said that the Lord had closed her womb. And that was the general consensus of people in that day. That when something was happening like that, it was God's doing. And we don't know why. We know today of lots of reasons why women can't have babies. And we've got lots of medical techniques now to help with that. And that's great. And I'm so excited for those who can experience that joy now. But the belief was that the Lord had closed her womb. And we don't know why. Scripture doesn't say why specifically God had not allowed her to have kids up to that point. We can speculate at it. We can say it may have been just for such a time as this, as we would read in another story. That God was preparing her for something, to see the intensity of her prayers go up and up. We don't know why bad things happen to good people. What we do know is that God works through those situations for our benefit in the end and to bring him glory. And he's a God who can be trusted. We could read in the New Testament some encouraging words. James, as we're doing the study on Wednesday mornings, describes it like this. He says, you want something, but don't get it. You kill and cover it, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. James describes all the ways that we go about trying to achieve something in life. He says, the real problem comes in because you do not have, because you do not ask God. So number one for you to think about today is to make prayer a priority in dealing with the situation that you're in in life. Are you bathing it in prayer? Is it more than just a Sunday morning thing? But is it a constant engagement with God to pray? Second thing I want to talk about this morning that we see in the life of Hannah. To make worship a habit. Now, if you're new here this morning, you haven't been here in a little while, um, we just got done doing a five-week series called The Obsession. And what is worship for? And I'll encourage you, if you want to give a video off of the table in the back, to take a look at some of those. If you want to go on YouTube to our new channel that's set up out there, you can take a look at one of those uh, messages. But we learn from Hannah what it means to make worship a habit. When she receives the news and the blessing from Eli, look at what she does the very next thing. It says, early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So, how are you living a life of worship? That was the question we had in the last series. What is it that your heart is burning for? I don't want to encourage you 
to make it more than just a once a week experience. It's so much more than just singing, but to make worship a greater part of your life. Now I'll jump on to number three. The number three thing that we learn in Hannah's story is to make sacrifice an expectation. And I'm always troubled by that when somebody paints the picture to somebody who's outside of the family of God. He says, well, all i got to do is just believe in Jesus. And yeah, that's part of it. Believing in Jesus doesn't mean that all of your problems suddenly went away. Believing in Jesus begins to help you have an understanding that there's more than just my situation. God's overall story of what he's been doing from the beginning of time through the end of time as a grand story of his glory. Part of that involves sacrifice. And too many times we want to say, well, if you just believe in Jesus, everything's going to be all set. You're going to have just the rose-colored glasses. Everything all of a sudden just works out hunky-dory. And we miss this idea that there is sacrifice involved. No, we don't do animal sacrifices anymore like they did in the Old Testament. I'm thankful that we don't have to do that anymore. But what does it mean to have sacrifice in our life? And Hannah knew it. And Hannah understood it. And Hannah practiced it and was blessed because of it. The story continues on in 1 Samuel and says, When the man Elkanah went up with his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Hannah's decided she's going to follow through on the promise that she's made to God. This one thing that she wanted more than anything else in the world. She's going to turn back to God. She's going to sacrifice. She's not going to put him to death. She's going to make him a living sacrifice. She's going to take him to live all of his days before the Lord and to serve him. She's going to take that which was so precious, she's waited so long for, and she's going to turn it back to God. And I think God asked that of you and I. He asked us to consider what are the things that he's blessed us with that we would turn back to him, that we would be a living sacrifice. Maybe it's in our careers. Maybe it's in our families. Maybe it's in the finances he's blessed us with. To say, Lord, in all of these areas, it's all yours. You've blessed me with it, and I want to be a living sacrifice. Lord, take me and use me. Take the things you've blessed me with and use them for your glory. And Elkanah gives a wise response. He says, do what seems best to you. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Elkanah said, if this is your choice, if this is what you want to do, I support you in it. And after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. She followed through on her promise. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. She fulfilled her dues. She fulfilled her vow. I said, Lord, he is yours. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And Samuel wasn't just any little boy. Samuel was a transition in God's story. Of living in the time of prophets to judges. God used him in a mighty way. And God used him at a young age even. God spoke to this little boy. And not only did he just worship there, but he learned the ways of God. And God spoke to him and brought about amazing changes because of it. Because his mama said, I'm going to teach you to believe. And I'm going to teach you to belong. So three things I want to encourage you with this morning. Make prayer a priority. Now, we can say lots of things about prayer. We learned this this week in our study in James, the beginning of it. 
when you make prayer a priority, you have to believe. James said the person that prays and does not actually believe is wasting their breath. When we make prayer a priority, we have to believe that God is able, God wants to, and God will bring about the changes that we desire after, from him. We pray according to his will. Lord, show me your ways, and he will answer. Number two, to make worship a habit. And again, a habit beyond just a Sunday morning going to church thing. How do you live a life of worship? In all things that we do, and we've talked about in that series, that in everything that we say and do and think and act upon, that it would be with the idea that I'm doing it all in the name of the Lord. Work as though we're working for God, not for men. Make worship a habit. And the third thing we just talked about is make sacrifice an expectation. As we live a life following after God, realize that there's sacrifice that comes along with that. Not because he wants to hurt us. Not because he wants us to go without something. But because he wants us to trust him. God's no stranger to sacrifice. In fact, we celebrate this morning the risen Lord who also taught us how to believe and belong because Jesus sacrificed himself for you and I on the cross 2,000 years ago. He willingly followed all of the things that his Father in heaven wanted. He taught people how to believe and belong. And then he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And maybe you've never thought about that. Maybe you've thought, God's mad at me. Maybe you've thought, I don't know. Today I want to encourage you to think about the God who has given all for you and I. That we could live a life brand new. Let me pray for you in that. Father, this morning I thank you that you are awesome and holy. Father, thank you for our moms. Thank you for those who have taught us to believe and belong. Lord, thank you for those who didn't, and we can see the difference. Father, I pray today for not only the women who are here, but the men as well. Father, that we would live a life following after you. Jesus, thank you that you took all of our sins on yourself when you died on the cross. You paid for them on the cross of Calvary. And by your wounds were healed. Thank you for those who are going through that process in life right now of, of healing. Through the scars that have been handed to us. Thank you, Jesus, that you alone are able to bring about the change in life. So I pray today that it would be a day of worshiping you. Father, that in our lives we would make prayer a priority and that we would believe that we would see the model of Hannah and that we would trust in you, that we would sacrifice those things which you ask us to, those things which sometimes get in the way of truly following after you, and that we would lay them at your feet. I thank you for those that do that in works of service. I thank you for those who do things not only in this building but in this community. And it's been great to see the number of people who are going out and using what God has given them to bless others. I thank you for the sense that's going among the churches in this community to want to help more. Thank you for the work that's going on to bring about change in our community, to show people your love. God, you're awesome. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for those who commit to this church, not only in attendance, Lord, but in service here. Thank you for those who are engaging with others and helping them along in their walk with you. Thank you for those who give a tithe of what you've blessed them with financially so that we can continue going and reaching the lost for you. God, continue to bless us as we give to you in a sacrificial way, Father, because you are holy and just and there is no one like you. Continue to bless us as we worship you. I pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.